Hi, welcome to APES, uh, AP Environmental Science. My name is Mr. Sampson, and uh, the way I like to run this class is by using what's called a flipped model. And what that means is your homework most nights is going to be to watch a screencast like this one. Uh, now, you don't necessarily have to watch the screencast. If you prefer, you can just look at the presentation. I will say in doing that, you will miss out on some information. It's just you know, I, I say more in my screencast than I actually put on the uh, slide presentations. Yeah, you're mature learners, you know yourself as a learner, I'll leave it up to you, but I would recommend that you listen to the screencast. But anyway, that's what your homework is going to be. And then at the beginning of each class, you'll find that what we have is a uh, an entry task, a bell work, where we uh, respond to some questions about the screencast that you watched prior to that class. And then we go on and do some investigations uh, during class time. And so since we do a lot of scientific investigations in my class, and since that's a major part of the AP test that you'll be taking in May, I think it's worth spending some time in this first screencast to go over the different types of scientific investigations that we'll uh, be dealing with. Okay, so first of all, the purpose of a scientific investigation is just to collect evidence about something. Uh, science is different from a lot of other pursuits in that we always try to make our arguments based on collected evidence. And if the evidence supports our ideas, great. And if it doesn't, we have to let go of them. So it's worth noting that our evidence never proves an idea. Well, we can disprove an idea. We can say, well, well the evidence shows this is clearly not true, but we never know if something really is true. So what we're doing is we're just collecting evidence to support our arguments. Now, this evidence takes two forms. It can be what's called qualitative data, which does not involve any kind of numeric value. So uh, I can talk about uh, the changing color of the water or the the I can uh, the, the smell that's present uh, or the behavior of animals, things like that. Now, this is important data. It is it's it is things that we can observe and reproduce it and other people in other parts of the world could, could validate our study based on it. Uh, but it doesn't involve numbers, whereas quantitative data involves numbers. And the, the power of quantitative data is that it is very reproducible. And, and keep in mind, one of the main things you need to ask yourself when you're writing up a scientific investigation this year is, is my description of this investigation such that a person could read it and reproduce it and get similar data? And if the answer is no, then you're doing it wrong. You, sh you should always write up your, your document in such a way that a person could look at it and say, yep, if I do what this person said, I'll get pretty much the same results. Now, quantitative data helps with this because uh, when we when we use uh, visual descriptors, there's a little bit of ambiguity. But when I use numeric descriptors, there's no ambiguity. If I say 17 degrees Celsius, it means the same thing to everybody. If I say eight hours, it means the same thing to everybody. So quantitative data is more powerful. It's not always available. But keep in mind, qualitative data is still meaningful and it can still be used. Now, you're probably familiar with these terms here, but but in, in, in scientific investigations, it's very important to keep in mind three variables, okay? So uh, one is called the independent variable. This is the variable that you are going to make changes to or that you have a hypothesis about. So it is a, a value or a condition that the investigator uh, uh, tries to, to manipulate in some way or at least has a hypothesis about. The dependent variable is something that responds to changes in the independent variable. So if the independent variable gets bigger, what does the dependent variable do? Okay, so, so what it does depends on what happens to the independent variable. And then we have what's called controlled variables. And this is a very important one for you to understand because controlled variables are, are what make or break a scientific investigation. If you don't have good controlled variables, then you don't really know how the independent variable is affecting the dependent variable. So here's the thing to keep in mind with controlled variables. If there is something other than the independent variable that could affect the value of the dependent variable, then you need to keep it constant so that it's not what's causing the dependent variable to change. So just because you can think of something that is always the same, you know, it's the, you know, it's the, I use the same equipment. That's, that's not what we're talking about. A control variable is something that could have an influence on the dependent variable. Now, I'm just going to try to think of something off the top of my head. Let's just say I'm doing an investigation to see uh, how does the uh, change in the temperature of water affect the breathing rate of fish. Okay. Well, you know what? Uh, the beaker it's in, now I might do it five different times with five different temperatures. So that's my independent variable, the temperature. The dependent variable would be the breathing rate of the fish. The controlled variables would be something that I think could also affect the breathing rate of the fish. Now, I don't think the 
type of beaker I have matters. But I do think the size might matter because different amounts of water could affect how much oxygen is available to the fish. So I'd want to have as a controlled variable the same size beaker. I want to have the same salinity of water. Uh, I'd want to have the same starting uh, dissolved oxygen. Things that could actually affect the breathing rate of the fish, which is the dependent variable, those things need to be kept the same. If, if it doesn't really matter to the dependent variable, then I don't keep it the same. Okay, controlled samples or groups are not the same thing as an experimental control. Really, an experimental control is something that I keep the same so it doesn't affect my dependent variable. A controlled sample or controlled group is something different. That is, uh, I want to have a sample or a group for purposes of comparison. I want to say that this is something that did not experience the change uh, uh, imposed by the independent variable. So uh, let's just say I want to find out the effect of uh, salt water on plant growth. Okay, what I do is I would take one, one group of plants, right, my control group, and I just give them regular water like they would normally get. And then I have my experimental group, which I'm going to uh, put salt water on. And that's because that's what I have a hypothesis about. So that's the, 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 the presence or absence of salt water is my independent variable and plant growth is going to be my dependent variable. But I, I, want, I'm, I want to be able to compare it to what would happen normally. So that untreated group, that's what I call my control group, my control sample. Now, there's three different types of, of scientific investigation, and, and it's really important to keep this in mind. I, I think it's, it's very common for us to just think in terms of the experimental variable. Uh, an experimental uh, type of investigation, but there are two other types, and and in, in environmental science in particular, these other two types are definitely often employed. So let's just look at them. the first one is called a descriptive investigation, and basically all that means is we're simply describing, quantifying uh, a system, and that system could be like a forest or a coral reef or a soil sample, whatever. I'm just I'm just describing what's there. I'm, I'm collecting data that could then be used to make inferences about about how these systems operate and, and dependencies between variables within it. But right now, I'm just I'm just collecting information that's descriptive and it's very useful. It doesn't need to say I even have to have like a, a hypothesis about. I'm just collecting information. Now, a comparative uh, investigation is one like I just described with the control group. It's where I say like I think that I, I want to know. How does a particular uh, uh, condition affect something else? All right. So, so in other words, I'm going to collect data on a system population to see how does uh, the change in temperature affect this, or how does the uh, change in rainfall affect this? So, I, I'm comparing uh, the differences that occur in different uh, in different conditions. An experimental uh, investigation is what we often think of and what, what you've probably studied in in chemistry or physics and basically and, and, I'm, and I like these too so I'll, I'll do a lot of them but it's important and this isn't the only kind so an experimental investigation is generally done in a laboratory environment and it, it, it's one of which we're basically just saying look if I make incremental changes to the independent variable what happens to the dependent variable and the power of this is it allows me to to be very specific about the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. In fact, it often lets me express it mathematically, which I couldn't do with the other two types of studies. So you can see why it's, it's very powerful, but it's a little bit difficult, especially in environmental science, where you have so many different uh, uh, compounding variables to, to, to actually uh, properly do uh, an experimental investigation. Okay. Let's just dive in a little bit deeper here. So a descriptive investigation, uh, basically what we're doing is, again, we're just making observations, we're taking measurements, we're recording what we've got. And, and we don't necessarily have to have any kind of hypothesis going to this. We're simply collecting information. Uh, and, and, and later from that, we might come up with some hypotheses to test. But, but basically, I want to lay out a particular methodology so that people understand and they can replicate my methodology. Uh, they, can, they can determine if my methodology was valid or not. Uh, you can reach conclusions about about what 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 is true about this environment I'm looking at, but it doesn't involve the variables that we talked about. It doesn't have. There's no independent variable. There's no dependent variable. There's no control variables. I'm simply observing what's there. I'm describing a, a system. Okay. So let's look at one example I have here. Okay. Let's just say there's this island, and we want to see like, well, you no. Know, let's just look at the bird colonies on this island. And we're just going to map out where they are. There's this many birds of this species living in this type of location on a cliff. 
there's this many of this species and they tend to live in, in near the tops of trees and there's this many of this species that tend to make burrows uh, in the uh, the sand near the shoreline whatever okay so we're simply just we're just recording what we see or we say okay well you know there's we're going to measure the salinity of marsh water uh, at different points in a marsh and then we're going to count how many uh, fish of which type species are present in those different salinities. We don't necessarily have any kind of a, a, of a, a preconceived notion of what we're going to find. We're simply collecting that, uh, that information and then we're going to analyze it later to try to figure out the, the sort of parameters that guide this system. Now, comparative investigations, here we're basically collecting data about a population uh, or like the, you know, the basically some variable we can think of yeah, the population of an organism, the amount of runoff, how much CO2 is in the atmosphere under different conditions in order to make a comparison. So the idea is I have two different conditions or more conditions, and I just want to see how does a particular variable respond to that. All right. So this does involve a hypothesis. Usually I, I say like, well, you could, it doesn't have to, but we say like, okay, uh, I think that as the salinity goes up, here's what's going to happen. Uh, I think that, you know, as the temperature goes down, here's what's going to happen. It, it may or may not involve controlled variables. If it does, it's usually not ones that the, the experimental gets to, to implement themselves, although it could. Uh, and, and one thing is it's often performed in nature uh, rather than in a laboratory. So uh, that's very useful in environmental science because when I do things in a laboratory, I've isolated so many variables, it no longer really reflects the natural environment. But if I go out into nature, it's hard to implement those experimental controls but I can often get a more realistic view of what's going to happen. So let's just look at a couple examples I have here. I say, okay, runoff is something we'll definitely study a lot this year. So runoff is basically how much water flows across the ground instead of going into the soil, okay, and becoming groundwater. So, so basically I go, well, I'm just going to compare two areas, one that's forested, the trees are all there, one where they've cut down the trees is what we call a clear cut. We'll definitely talk about that a lot this year. And I just want to see how does that affect during a rain event, how much water ends up in the stream. We call that runoff, right? So I just want to compare the, the water flow in the forested stream to the one in, where we've cut down all the trees. Now, I probably have a hypothesis there's going to be a lot more water when I cut down the trees. Uh, and I also can implement some controls here. Now, I, I, I don't I don't control the environment or something. I'm not going out there and, and, and making these controls, but I can, I can choose where to take my measurements. I can say, I'm going to compare an area that has a, a similar land area, right? These two environments have similar land areas. They have similar steepness to their slopes because uh, I think I think the steepness could affect how much water sinks in the soil or doesn't. Uh, the amount of area can affect how much water is in the stream. I'm going to uh, try to... Um, uh, take into account how much rainfall. Clearly, if, if more rainfall is coming down in one area than another one, that's going to affect uh, the amount of of, of uh, runoff. So, so there are controls involved, but basically, I'm just controlling. I'm, I'm rather comparing the the two areas. Uh, another, well, I could do it in a laboratory too. I could say, okay, in a laboratory, I will probably do this this year. I'm going to I'm going to put fertilizer on this plant. I'm not going to put fertilizer on that plant. So the one I don't put fertilizer on. That's my control sample. The one I do is on my experimental sample. And after a certain amount of time, I'm going to compare the two uh, in terms of uh, plant growth. And then we have experimental investigations. So experimental investigations are one in which the independent variable uh, is incrementally changed. I make it bigger and bigger and bigger, or smaller, smaller, smaller. So I'm making these changes and then recording what the corresponding uh, response in the, the dependent variable is. And then from that, I can often come up with a mathematic relationship between the variables. Uh, so that's the power, powerful thing about this is it gives me a, a very quantitative approach to it. So, so experimenters like this, but in order to do it, you have to have a very strong controls over the variables that could affect the dependent variable. You have to say had a, a strong ability to, to implement experimental controls if you're really going to find the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. So for that reason, these are usually performed in a laboratory environment where we have the ability to do that. Uh, so basically, uh, we're going to implement very rigid controls and we're just going to change the independent variable and then measure what happens to the dependent variable. And, and this is very powerful. The problem is, in environmental science, it doesn't always necessarily apply to the more complex nature that we encounter in the real world. But here's an example of it. Let's just say I want to say, okay, uh, now it's a no-brainer, right? The, the photosynthesis has to do with plants taking in light and making sugars, right? So clearly the brightness should be a factor. So if I want to, how does the amount of brightness affect plant growth? My hypothesis would be, you know what? 
brighter light probably makes for for more photosynthesis. So I would test it this way in an experimental investigation. What I would do is I would incrementally change how much brightness my plants are being exposed to. And I would want to measure some dependent variable that would uh, be a way of, of measuring photosynthesis. So I could say I'm going to measure by uh, changes in CO2 because during photosynthesis, plants take CO2 in. Uh, and, but, but I had to think about my control variables, right? So I'm, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to measure how much photosynthesis is happening with a certain brightness, and then I'm going to make it brighter and see how much there is, and brighter or dimmer and dimmer. So I'm, I'm going to keep changing the independent variable brightness and look for corresponding changes in the dependent variable photosynthesis. But what I'm really measuring it by is the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, what else could control the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere? Well, uh, I, you know, or how much photosynthesis is occurring. So in order to do that, I need to think, okay, well, the species of plant would matter. You, know, you don't want to compare two totally different species of plants because they have different uh, rates of, product, of productivity or photosynthesis. Uh, we'd want the plants to be the same size, even if they're the same species. If one's bigger, clearly it's going to engage in more photosynthesis. We'd want to give the same amount of water to both plants because water is an important part of, of the photosynthesis equation. So anything I think could, could affect it I would, I would want to control, and in a laboratory environment, I can do that. Okay, so that's how we do scientific investigations. Thanks for watching the screencast. Get used to it. Listen, you watch these things every day, and you will be ready for that AP test come May. All right? I'll try to keep it short of this in the future, but I'm not making any promises. Thanks for watching.